So we now have a full three-dimensional theory for the mechanical behavior of elastic solids. So there, it involves 18 variables. There are three displacements, there are nine stress quantities, and six strain quantities. There are six equilibrium equations. Three of those are partial differential equations. Three are algebraic equations. Those are the ones in, that equate the corresponding shear stresses to each other. There are six kinematic equations so that, that relate the strains to the displacements. Those are partial differential equations and there's six algebraic constitutive equations. So it, it, it's quite a, a formidable set of equations that govern the three-dimensional behavior of the deformation of solids. Um, now hand solutions to these equations, as it's probably easy to imagine, are rather hard to come by. In fact, very few hand solutions exist. So doing analysis with this full set of equations can be quite challenging by hand, though in some cases you can do it. Now, Numerical solutions are also possible, so you can use numerical techniques to approximate the equations and come to good solutions to the full set of equations. And probably the most common way of doing that is to use something known as finite element analysis. So finite element analysis is a numerical uh, way of solving partial differential equations. And so that's quite effective, and it is quite common in, in, in practice. But it also takes a lot of effort, and sometimes it's, it's much better to be able to do hand solutions first to get uh, good approximations and understandings of what's going on. And it turns out that if you make a judicious choice of assumptions, you can actually convert the PDEs, which is really the hard part of the equations, into ordinary differential equations. And that actually makes hand solutions possible. And, and that's what I'd like to discuss a little bit more. So in particular, I'd like to go back and visit the 1D bar problem. The 1D bar problem, we used ODEs, and we were able to apply loads to a mechanical system in one dimension, and we could do all sorts of things with it. We could calculate stresses and strains and internal forces and, and things like that. And it was actually quite manageable. And so the, the question I'd like to look at is, well, how is that related to this full three-dimensional theory that we've spent the past few lectures developing? So. The basic connection between the 1D problem and the full 3D problem is based on a number of assumptions. And they tend to start with physical assumptions, which lead to what are known as kinematic assumptions. So you deform the body in a particular way, and you look at its motion, you measure it, and then you notice certain things about it that are can lead to simplifying relationships in the, in the system. And so let's consider a bar that we pull on. And let me go ahead and draw a green line on the side here. So I'm going to label some of the material particles so that I can observe what they do kinematically, so what their motion is. So if I pull on the bar, it's going to extend. And what I notice is that this vertical line of material that I colored, it remained planar after deformation. So, And this is known as the assumption of plane sections remain plane. It's a really common observation in physical systems that you deform with, say, axial loads. And really, the other thing we notice is that most of the motion happens in the x direction and that it doesn't depend on the, the y and, and the z uh, coordinates of the system. So in particular, if I, if I label these in the usual fashion, x, y, and z, there's no z and y dependence on the x displacement. And the other thing that you find in the laboratory is that this observation is extraordinarily robust. You can, you can do this, say, on a bar of steel, and you'll see it. Uh, you could deform the bar into the plastic range, so well past the elastic range, you'd still see the same observation. You can make the bar out of a composite set of materials, say, you know, a, a concrete pipe filled with, you know, steel pipe filled with concrete, uh, and you'd still see the same observation. So it's, it's very, very robust. And so, this is really the starting point of trying to develop a simple theory from the 3D theory as a kinematic assumption, namely that the displacement is simply a function of x and not depending on y and z. Okay? And, and also ignoring any sort of Poisson effects in the y and the z directions. And so that tells us that, well, we have one fundamental kinematic relationship, which is epsilon is equal to du dx. So that's what we saw in the 1D bar problem without all the subscripts. Now, the second assumption that we can make in the 1D bar problem is that it, the bars are, are typically slender, and so we could assume a 1D stress state. So that sigma xx is the only non-zero stress. So that wipes out all the other stress variables from the problem. So it takes us from nine stress variables to one stress variable. Okay. Now, if I calculate the corresponding strain in 3D associated with this 1D state of stress, you'll notice that I have strains in the 
the y and in the z direction. So it kind of contradicts our kinematic assumption that we're only going to have to deal with one strain. But we're making assumptions and sometimes you end up with contradictory facts in, in what you do and you have to check whether they're valid at the end of the day. Uh, so we'll go ahead and consider that we only have one constitutive equation which is that epsilon xx is equal to sigma xx over e and we'll ignore these two transverse components that we see sitting over here. And so there's a contradiction there, but it turns out to actually not make a difference. And one can actually prove that formally, but it's a little complex to do. So now let's look at equilibrium. So if we take our assumptions, namely the 1D stress state assumption, and look at all six equilibrium equations, what we find out is that there's only one equilibrium equation that matters. All the rest are identically satisfied. And that's that the derivative of sigma xx with respect to x plus the body force in the x direction, so that's body force per unit volume, is equal to zero. Now if I want to connect this to the one-dimensional equilibrium equations that we've been looking at, let me first um, define the resultant force on the cross section. So the resultant force in the x direction is just the integral of sigma xx over the cross-sectional area. And the way I can get these two things to kind of come together is I can integrate my 3D equilibrium equation across the cross section. So I'll do an integral over the area of this equilibrium equation here. And what I'm going to find is dr dx plus b equals zero, where I now define b as the integral of bx over the cross sectional area. So this b here is per unit length, and this one here is per unit volume. So that's the connection there. But you'll notice now what I have in this box, this box, this one, and this one are the 1D equations that we were working with before. So you can reduce down to the one-dimensional case typically through a kinematic assumption coupled with some type of stress assumption. And this is a very effective way to coming to workable theories so you can solve practical engineering problems relatively easily. So you don't have to deal with the partial differential equation. So you can get a lot of mileage out of this. Um, so just uh, a simple remark here. So what we've done is we have one kinematic assumption and we have uh, one stress assumption in the system. So one kinematic assumption, one stress assumption, and it produces this set of equations over here. So there's a, there's a stress strain or sorry, strain displacement law. There is an equilibrium equation. There's a strain stress law, so uh, the constitutive relationship, and then there's a definition of the resultant. And you'll notice there's one added thing here that's different from what we were doing before is that in the way I've set it up the stress on the cross section can actually be a function of y and z. Okay, So the strains are only a function of x because of my kinematic assumption that the plane section remains plane but that doesn't restrict the stresses to have to be uniform on the cross section and in particular they can be non-uniform on the cross section when the Young's modulus is not uniform on the cross section. And the other implication of that is that the resultant force, R, is not necessarily the stress times the area. It's actually the integral of the stress over the area. Now, if the stress is uniform on the cross-section, then that integral becomes stress times area, but only in that particular case. So, And we get a more general theory. It allows the Young's modulus to vary on the cross-section. The area can also vary along the length of the bar, so this, this integral here may depend on the cross-section that you're looking at, if it's, say, a tapered bar. And also that the resultant is not always equal to the stress times the area.